Uh, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and friends beyond the binary, it's time for the podcaster. You know, the, if, if there was going to be any, you know, protesting time, changing the time, I guess I would be the one to do it. But I'm instead, instead I'm just going to push you to sleep. It's time for the podcast to push you to sleep, sleep with me. And tonight's episode, as are almost all our episodes, are supported by listeners. Our show, our main way to support the show is listener support. And the best way to support the show is on a small monthly basis over at Patreon. You can go to sleepwithmepodcast.com slash patron, P-A-T-R-O-N. You know, we, we put the podcast out free uh, 12 times a month, free archives and everything. And in order to do that, uh, if you give value on the show, I'll ask and say, Jesus, do, do, do you value the show at a dollar a month? Because that's a huge help. Or do you get about as much as you pay for Netflix, like $5 a month, $10 a month? If, if you can spare it, if you can afford it, and if you value the show... Before you hit play tomorrow night, I guess, because this is already playing, say, huh. Let's ask you, before you hit play on the show, say, geez, how much do I value the show? And think about supporting us on Patreon, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash patron, uh, P-A-T-R-O-N. Uh, tonight's episode is about, uh, kind of touches on the, the Harmontown podcast. And as I've been recommending podcasts, if you like Dan Harmon's Harmontown podcast, you know, there's another great improv podcast that's uh, one of the people that performs on the show. Nug is a huge supporter of this podcast and a great, great guy. And the name of that podcast is Illusionoid. And it's like kind of got the best things about improv comedy and old time radio. If you like this podcast and you like Harmontown, uh, do yourself a huge favor and subscribe to Illusionoid podcast by our buddy Nug. Uh, so get out there and do that. A little bit of uh, a couple of announcements coming up here. So I'm going to be on the Harmontown podcast. I don't have a calendar in front of me. Well, let me pause it. I think I'm going to be on the Harmontown podcast on th- Sunday, uh, 23rd. So, uh, g- you know, if, if you're in the L.A. area and you want to come by, you know, get, c- come by uh, uh, for the taping. And, and I should have links to, to how to do that in the show notes because uh, I, I don't have it in front of me, of course. So that's October 23rd. A couple other dates to pay attention to. So October 23rd, come by Harmontown and, and see see me on the show. Help, help me out. You know, well, that'd be great. Uh, you know, make me feel comfortable. Then a, a friend of the show, a listener, Sophia, is in a, a Tom Stoppard play at the Act Theater here in the Bay Area, The Hard Problem. And I would love to go show our support and enjoy an evening or afternoon of art and if anyone wants to join me, I'm thinking about going to, uh, let's see, the Saturday, October 28th uh, matinee, 2 p.m., The Hard Problem. Let me know. Either email me, feedback at sleepwithmepodcast.com, or tweet me, or Facebook me. And let me know. You want to go to a play and support the listeners, or we could grab coffee or food or something. Uh, but let me know. I'd love, I'd love for, for some of us to go and say, hey, we love art and we, we love uh, artists, working artists like Sophia. And then yet another outing is our good friends at Criminal Podcast are coming to the Bay Area uh, November 14th. I don't know what day of the week that is, but that's November the 14th. And if anybody's interested in going to that, let me know. I, I, that'll probably sell out really fast. Uh, I don't know when to get but let me know if you want to go, and then we can work out a plan. But I'm definitely going to try to go to that, and I'm going to go see Sophia, and then I'll be on Dan's show. And that'll all be in the show notes. And that's in L.A. for Harmontown and in San Francisco for the other for Criminal and, uh, and to see Sophia in the American Conservatory Theater uh, performance of A Hard Problem. Uh, so that's the, the announcements, uh, housekeeping around the web, www.sleepwithmepodcast.com. Older episodes are there. You can comment on our show notes. Get me on Twitter at Dearest Scooter. Feedback at sleepwithmepodcast.com is the email. Did I say that? I guess my brain's mixed up all of a sudden. Those are the ways to get a hold of me. Uh, they say on Twitter on Dear Sco- at Dear Scooter. Uh, I want to thank Chris Posty Posters and from Sounds Like an Earful who edited this episode. Jonathan Mann who does our lullabies. He's at JonathanMann.net. Uh, Posty Posters sends it sound like Sounds Like an Earful Studios. 
I want to thank Scotty and Jennifer on our, on our, on our artwork. I want to thank all the patrons that support the show on Patreon and all the other people that support the show every other way you support the show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's some listeners that support the show by creating a community around the show, and those are our moderators over at our, the, the listener Facebook group, which you can get to through sleepwithmepodcast.com slash nods, N-O-D-S. And that's uh, Summer and Sarah, uh, Julie and Jennifer and Laura and Lida. And that's it. Let's get on with the show. I hate you all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep. Well, welcome. This is Sleep With Me, the podcast that's here to put you to sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, turn out the lights and press play. I'm going to do the rest. And what I'm going to do is create a safe place where you can set aside whatever's keeping you up at night, whether it's thinking... Feeling, sensing, you know, physical sensations, emotional feelings, you know, stuff that happened yesterday, stuff that happened a few years ago, or stuff you're thinking about that's coming up, or if it changes in routine, or if something, you know, that that uh, could be something I don't even know about, uh, but maybe I can relate to it because I've had trouble sleeping. But maybe here's what I'm gonna do. Here's the safe place. It's a place where I'm gonna try to distract you from that. What I'm going to do is send my voice across the deep dark night. I'm going to use creaky, these creaky dulcet tones. I have a pair of wings of pointlessness. Uh, also, you know, overuse of alliteration. I'll be put, you know, there, there, there was this song, pour some sugar on me. I would say pour some alliteration on me. You know, if I, was, if I ever do a modeling shoot... They'd say, you know, they'd say, well, geez, what can it, how do you want to theme the shoot, your photo shoot? I guess it's a photo shoot. Uh, <laughs> excuse my presumption. Uh, they'd say, well, I'd like to do it uh, with pour some alliteration on me. And they'd say, I'm sorry, excuse me? And they'd say, well, first of all, you, how come you're taking my photos without a beret on? And they say, S- pour some alliteration on me. What does that mean? I said, well, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I'd like to... They say, are there going to be fans at my photo shoot? And they say fans like listeners. No, 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 fans, like blowing fans. And they say, well, you don't have hair at your first. You don't really need fans to blow your hair. They say, okay, you're right about that. Have you looked into that pouring alliteration on me? And they say, that's a, a turn in, isn't that a phrase? Isn't that something that's uh, in, used in the written and spoken languages and not... Uh, doesn't try, you know, it's it's a herd and it can be seen on paper. Maybe we could do some signs, you know, some alliterative signs. How's that? No, 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 no. How do you can't pour a sign on me, can you? Could I mean, because that doesn't sound like a safe idea, but pouring sign, I didn't say pour some signs on me. I said, I want you to pour some alliteration. Could, oh, excuse me, photographer, I'm in the middle of a podcast. Uh, I'll be right back. A podcast intro. Hey, sorry, everybody. Got distracted once again. If you're new here, this happens pretty often. So I'll just set up. The, so I'm going to do an intro here. It's going to if you uh, it could you could feel like it's dragging on, but that's intentional. It's also organic. It's intentional and organic. You know, just like food. You know, I guess it's like for. I guess I'm more of a forager. Say, describe your podcast method to us. Well, it's a bit like foraging for. I'm a story forager. And I don't say that in jest. I guess that's actually what I do, especially Tuesdays uh, tonight. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, dra- you know, I'll drag out this int- intro. I'm going to be foraging for metaphors here. Might get back to that photography shoot. Not sure if I can, uh, you know, get you know, dig for any truffles or whatever. You know, because I think they say, well, she's foraging with so three years ago. What do you... Uh, and I say, yeah, I miss the forging boom. I'm sorry that I missed the forging boom. I miss every boom by about three years. I'm a, like, uh, I'm not, an, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm post-hip, uh, you know, what can I say? And they say, post-hip, that is so cool. And I say, that's right. Uh, I said, what about, because po- no, you know why I am, because I'm a story forager. You forge stories? No, 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 not a story forager. I'm a story forager. And they say, okay. But I say, that's pretty good. Forging, for, I'm a for, forage forager. I said, that's some alliteration. You, did you know I was in the middle of an alliter, alliteration photo shoot? 
and they say, you're kidding me. You were shooting alliteration with fo- you're taking photos of alliteration. That is, uh, that is post tip. And they said, no, I was, uh, he said, actually, I forage for alliteration. Actually, I'm in the middle of, uh, I, I was in the, you're, the, you're distracting me from a distraction from a podcast intro. Excuse me. Uh, uh, you know, whoever criticized my, uh, missing the foraging boom. Uh, but anyway, if you're new here, I'll, I'll be foraging for stories and metaphors. So we'll do a little story part. Or this is this episode's a little bit more about structure, story structure, and songs, or one song in particular. But uh, let's see, where was I? So, so if you're new here, it's the podcast meant to take your mind off stuff. I'm not, a, you know, clearly there's, you know, if if you were expecting something erudite or in, you know intelligent. Or, uh, like, uh, you know, meditative, you know, I got creaky dulcet tones. What can I, you know, I can't do much about that. I'm pretty sure I have some mu- mushrooms growing within my brain. So, you say, I mean, so that's why I have to forage for stories as opposed to, why don't you just tell stories? Well, in mush- brain mushrooms, that's where my stories come from, though. So, it's a good, and they say, yeah, I bet you I can only imagine what kind of mushrooms are growing in your brain. But so that's it. I mean, I, I would try to get back to this, um, this photo shoot thing. Cause it's just, you know, but, but so that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk here, but you just make yourself comfortable. You don't have to listen to me, but you're under no pressure to listen or fall asleep. You just kick back and it'll just be like, I'm just sitting within the vicinity of your room, uh, chatting you up and you say, well, this is, this is, this is my one friend that I would be comfortable calling a buffoon. They say, well, let's 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 not, let's use the bassoon. Why don't you just call me a bassoon? Uh, you know, because we're, we're since we're on the alliteration tip, I, I, I'm doing alt alliteration now. I say, well, what's that? I said, well, ever since I became post hip, I'm uh, I'm also into the alt scene. I'm using alt alliteration. Well, what's alt alliteration? Well, you'll say one word, and then I'll offer. In a litter of word, that doesn't mean the same thing, but we're going to use, like, buffoon, we're going to say bassoon from now on. And I can hear part of you that you see, first, your, your gut reaction is that doesn't make any sense. And they say, wait a second. It almost makes sense, but it's of no use. And I'd say, exactly. Uh, I'd say, can we, now this is a challenge to say, well, it's almost like it's useless. And I'd say, well, it's a, it's a oh boy, uh, what do you call this? So uh, they got a uh, like a uh, alliteration performance anxiety. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't have it useless. How did I manage to get one the one word that uh, starts with a use? Do 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 that I can't alliterate. But so let's just get back to that alliterative photo shoot. So if you're new here, though, that's what I'm gonna do. Let me ask you: Have you thought about anything other than? Like your brain will kind of, for a little while, if you're new, your brain might try to challenge and say, well, let's try to focus on what this guy's talking about. And then another party might get irritated and be like, he's not talking about anything. But once you see, I'm kind of in this middle ground uh, where it's like, uh, I'm talking and it, to me, it has meaning. Believe me, I'm not just sitting here chattering about nothing. I, I, to me, this all makes perfect sense. That's why this podcast works. Uh, and you say, why again? Well, hey, mu- mushrooms on the brain. That's why it works. And you'd say, that doesn't make any sense. I say, yeah, because you have a mushroom free brain. Congratulations. Uh, you know, you probably just use, you probably, you know, you don't need to use words like uh, uh, alt alliteration. You know, you know, you don't have any use for it. Uh, do, do you know any words that rhyme, like, that are alliterative, like, useless that I could use right now, this second and second? Oh, you're not real. You're a figment of my mate. Oh, thanks. I'll get back to the podcast intro then. So close it out. How would we, if we were going to do a, a photo shoot where we pour alliteration at me, would we use uh, alphabet soup or, or SpaghettiOs? Do they have SpaghettiOs with letters? But we'd have to pick out, you know, we could use that. Do they still have that cereal? What was it called? Alphabets or something? What was that cereal? It was like frosted letters. And they, they, they think they did away with that when they said that was too educational and tasteless. You know, make it into pebbles or 
be, you know, kids like eating oblong things for breakfast. You say, you don't, don't, you know, letters is too much. Uh, but yeah, maybe I could just pour. I mean, I don't know if I really want to cover myself in SpaghettiOs or whatever the heck that stuff is, or soup. No, no, no. I think I'd say dry cereal, then SpaghettiOs, then soup. I don't want to cover myself in soup. I could see, well, the SpaghettiOs, I mean, there's probably like, that might be good for my skin. At least I could tell myself that. You know, dried cereal. I'm trying to think what other... Cooked pasta. There you go. That's what a part of my brain just said. What about just cooked pasta, no sauce? I said, pour that on me. Pour that alliteration on me. And then they said, well, that's not alliteration. That's just letters. Then I said, well, it's just a photo shoot. Why are you taking it so seriously? And they said, well, you're the one that made all the demands. And I'd say, well, at least I decided to call it a photo shoot. Remember when I first started out, I called it a model shoot? I don't even know what, the, well, that's when you shoot models, uh, like, uh, and I say, yeah, airplane models, I used to shoot them off my roof. So there you go. I already, I have done a model shoot before. And I may have had, na- I wish I had named a plane, you know, the uh, USS Alliteration. So anyway, and I guess Barty might be like, I don't even think this guy knows. Honey, honey, are you listening? I don't think this man knows what alliteration is. And I would say the more to pity me with, you know, and to say, whew. Ooh, uh, that's what you could do. That's what some people tell me when they're like, they say, whew, good thing I'm not Scooter. Oh, boy, gosh, gosh, but gosh, uh, that guy. And they see, and then a lot of people, they'll, well, they'll say, hey, when you do that stuff, are you serious? Or And I say, oh, yeah. and for just being myself, unfortunately, you give me a mic and I start talking and the truth comes out. But here's the opportunity. I can use it to help you fall asleep. So, they, like, what greater use could I put my misuse of alliteration? Is that alliteration? When it, like, a use of my misuse, that's that's better than useless. So we may have, uh, that's alt alliteration for sure, for totally. Since I invented that word, I can, you know, define it. They say, I think he's trying to redefine words. And they say, well, you know, word scramble. They got, they got mushroom brain. Haven't I said that seven times tonight? So, but the main thing is I'm glad you're here because I've been sleepless. I've been lying there in the deep, dark night. That's why I send my voice across it uh, to, to help distract you, maybe to hold your hand if you're comfortable or walk at your side. Or just, you know, sit back as you float across the threshold into the arms of Morpheus. Or whatever sleep guide you choose, to, you know, where you say just the pillow, you know, pillow town. So I'm glad you're here. Uh, you know, podcast can't doesn't work for everybody. I hope it helps you. You know, give it a few tries if you're skeptical. But like I said, I'm glad you're here, and I really hope I really yearn to help you fall asleep. Hey, if I can just ask you one more time, if you can consider uh, becoming a patron and supporting the show on a monthly basis. A majority of the way we pay for some of the bills here is listener support. And it takes 20 hours of labor for each podcast episode. So that's about 60 hours a week. So if you get value out of the show, uh, if you can support it, a dollar a month or $5 a month is huge because it just helps us budget and pay the bills knowing we have so much money coming in every month. Sleepwithmepodcast.com slash patron. Thanks. Hey everybody! So it's uh, two. It's a two. Happy Tuesday to everyone. Uh, when I'm recording this, it's like September something. So by the time you hear this, actually, like uh, they, this episode may come out right around the time I'm supposed to go on Harmon Town, Dan Harmon's podcast. And I was pretty surprised to even be asked to go on, and I was really, uh, ner- I'm really nervous about it, obviously, because I want to be a good guest. And Dan's real funny. And uh, like, I just don't want to ruin his show. So hopefully I didn't if this, if you're hearing this afterwards and I don't think I, I'll just do my best and I could just, uh, you know, it's it, it, just follow his lead. That's what I keep telling myself. Just listen and, you know, do your best. But, but this is, it was so it, it's been about a month or month and a half since I knew I was going to go on the show and it's still a month away. And I knew a decent a bit about Dan. You know, I'd watched Har- the Harmontown documentary and I listened to the podcast uh, Harmontown, but, but uh, and I'd seen Community, 
and, you know, read some stuff about Dan, but I guess I did, like, I was a little bit ignorant of, like, how uh, much Dan's written about story structure and, uh, like, uh, how w- well uh, he's written about it. And uh, and I haven't even read everything, like, because once I read a few basic things that he had written about it, it was right around the time, it was exactly the same time as Nuns in Space was about to get started. And so this is going to be a little bit about story structure. Uh, so so just, uh, but it, it'll be rambling. So so you'll be set. Uh, uh, but but for those of you that like structure stuff or story stuff, or anybody that's a fan of the musical core, the core is it a chorus line or the chorus line? I don't know. But uh, like like those are the things we're going to touch on: dance, story structure, and a song from a chorus line. And you're already saying, oh, boy. But so I was reading a lot about Dan's, uh, like, thoughts about story structure, which we'll, we'll, we're going to put to practice here. And I'll, uh, like, butcher and paraphrase. And, and uh, But I'll look up some of the stuff from Dan that Dan talks about. Um, but, like, uh, so right before, like, uh, let's see, let's back up. So every time I start a new series, uh, the Thursday episodes are written ahead of time if you're new or you didn't, you say you write this stuff, Scoots. And I say, yeah, believe it or not, to make the podcast sound sleepy and like I'm sitting there telling you a story takes a lot of work. And I'll probably repeat this point a few times, but believe it or not, the more structured the story is, the more boring and meandering it can be. Because uh, just like having, because it's a structure, uh, I guess that uh, it explains it right there. Like, just because the story's structured doesn't mean it has to be interesting. It doesn't have to be great structure, perfect structure. So every time I've developed a series on the show that's written, which is every Thursday series, I've tried different ways of plotting them out. And it always comes down to, um, like, plotting out this. Sometimes I tried to plot out the season, and then every episode needs to be plotted out. And I've tried different types of story structure, or my own techniques, and I think this is a way anybody, they, like, this is how you learn structure, by, by like, like uh, keep trying. I mean, that's how I learned to make this podcast, just keep trying different things. And I had a couple of things before I discovered all Dan's writing, like, and I was like, huh, maybe I'll try that out for this season. And because Nuns in Space is kind of a procedural, it kind of frees me up from having the pressure of having an overarching narrative for the whole season and wanting it being like, okay, like, because they usually try to plot it out for like 12 or 14 episodes and then it always goes long uh, because the structure in a series, I mean, it's just not like, a, you know, I'm writing, I don't have a lot of lead time. So it was just a perfect uh, happenstance that I started reading about Dan's story structure. And I said, wow, this is interesting stuff. And it seems really useful and powerful. And it's based on some structure stuff that I already kind of, I mean, I mean, and I'll, I, maybe I'll just explain what story structure is, to, what it means to me in a second. But, but I said, geez, I could test this out with Nuns in Space and just see how it goes and see if I can learn it. And that's really the only... I mean, I'm sure if you're like uh, you're like someone that uh, like writes for a living already, you're you have a different perspective on that. And maybe if you're someone that just, geez, I, I want to start writing, maybe you have a different perspective. But I guess I'm like a person that's like, okay, I'm, I still don't find myself an, an adept storyteller, but I love stories. I love telling stories. I love dreaming stories and thinking of stories. And so what does story structure mean? I mean, like the classic story structure of most things is, you know, stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And then you might say, like, it has uh, stories have act one, act two, act three, beginning, middle, and end. Or they have act one, act two, A, act two, B. Like, that might be more movie structure, which is a... What I've always more focused on, but, like, it's what's interesting about Dan's thing while he was applying it to, like, some of his writings about his Channel 101 days, like, so sh- shorter story. I don't know. It can. It's not just about uh, TV or movies. Uh, so uh, I guess that's what story structure means to me. It's like uh, uh, how you t- start a story, 
and then how you find your way to the end. And, and even when I'm making up stories like uh, on the Tuesday shows, uh, they they still need to have some structure. It's not like I'm stopping and thinking about the structure. So, and that's what's so great about practicing writing or using a structure for one thing is that, oh, then maybe my brain's learning it. Because a Tuesday episode, when I'm making up a story, I still need to find my way to the end. Otherwise, I don't know where I'm going. And then the story, it doesn't have any structure to hang anything on. Or like if it's a puppet, or like it doesn't have, if it doesn't have a skeleton, like the structure, how am I going to move it around and pose it and say, hey, I, at the top of the day, you know, how can I have it tip its cap if it doesn't have a structure? And I talk about a lot of this. And if you're really new, you might be like, holy cow, this guy is very delusional. He makes a boring podcast that he only has to talk about nothing. And he really and, it, and he really believes he has to work hard at it or he really works hard at it. And I'd say, see, I do see the irony in that. And I would say if this podcast wasn't an extremely challenging thing for me, for me to make, I don't think I could make it three times a week, which I guess is paradoxical, too. But I believe as a maker of the Sleep With Me that uh, all the work that goes in the podcast and story structure are the things that make it work. And it's just like other than the hard work and rigor, I think the secret of the podcast is narrative structure or nar the narrative and our familiarity with the narrative. And that's why I say it's a bedtime story podcast because uh, – I think we crave story and we tell ourselves stories about ourselves at bedtime or about like the noises we're hearing. And sometimes they're simple stories like, geez, how irritating is that? And they say, what would I say to that person that's like honking that horn? It's still a story. And, and I guess if you break it down, it might not have a classic story structure. I don't know. I guess I'm rambling. That's one of the other things about this podcast that works, my ability to ramble and go on tangents. So I thought what would be so that so I came across Dan's story structure, started reading about it, but you only read so much. And the good thing is he's very concise and uh, simple. And a link to the articles. I think there's only like five or six that I read. Uh, very well written and, and easy to put right into use, which I think is great. So there's that's one thing. And then not that long after, after maybe a few weeks of playing around with this structure, this other thing came up for me, which was that it's, it's some intro recently. I was kind of half joking and half seriously talking about um, my inability to feel feelings and how, uh, like, a lot of times I don't have a big emotional range. I'm trying to learn how to do that, and sometimes I joke about it, and sometimes I'm kidding, and sometimes I'm serious that I'm like... Uh, a little bit numb inside or that I have trouble emoting or connecting with my feelings. And, uh, like, uh, you know, something I'm working on, I don't encourage it. I say, geez, do you do, don't, I don't, I don't recommend to kids. If you're listening, don't be dead inside or don't be, make yourself into an Island or a fortress or a fortress Island, which is what I think I have going uh, and become a hurt, you know, don't, don't do the, don't follow my path. Believe me, it might look, you say, oh boy, this guy's boring people to see. He's living large, boring people to sleep. I got it. You know, don't, you know, follow those other things like rigor. If you have something, just do it every day for a few minutes, whether it's playing the piano or painting model airplanes or telling stories or singing songs, do it every day. You know, find some other people that are doing it professionally and see what their thoughts are, especially if they're getting paid to do what you want to do instead of, te you know, like say, geez, do they, they have any comments on, uh, you know, the professional model airplane, but that might be not the best example. But, you know, there's probably people selling model airplane art somewhere. I mean, I would probably buy it for, you know, not full price, by the way, you know, give me a discount since I just invented this new art genre. Uh, you know, model airplane arts. Sorry, I guess, see, I get distracted. <laughs> but so I was thinking about my, like, uh, like how I joke and I'm serious about my inability to feel feelings. And then our friend Maggie, who's a poet out on Twitter, uh, we had a little interchange where we were kind of joking around. And I said, uh, you know, what best sums it up for me is a song from a chorus line, Nothing. 
uh, which is this great song, which we're going to, and, and, and then I listened to that song, like I listened to the original cast version and then the 2000 revival version um, about, uh, like, I don't know, a million times in a row. And I started to just realize, like, wow, this song is so well-structured. And they said, I wonder how this song applies to Dan's story structure. And I thought about it. They said, that would be a good podcast episode to break down the structure of the song and to kind of talk about what I love about the song in a way to talk about Dan's ideas around story structure. So I don't know if, you know, I guess we're going to do it. So uh, that's what we're going to do the rest of the episode. But, for, you know, first for anybody who says, who's Dan Harmon and what's a chorus line or the cor- it's a chorus line, I believe. Let me just do, you know, let me just consult Wikipedia here so I can get some facts. So Dan Harmon is American writer and producer, best known for creating NBC series Community, also co-created, which I just botched, uh, uh, the Adult Swim series Rick and Morty. Uh, he co-founded the alternative television network website Channel 101. That's where I got a lot of story structure for stuff from. Published a book, You'll Be Perfect When You're Dead, in 2013, working on a second book. And he hosts a podcast called Harmontown. He's from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Brown Deer High in his house. He briefly attended Glendale Community College, which became the uh, basis of the show community. So, I mean, I think a lot of podcast fans know who Dan Harmon is, and if you don't, you should check out his podcast, which is kind of like something like uh, it's it's just a uh, you know it's kind of one of those podcasts that's like part comedy show and interview show, kind of like like the Good Days of David. Le- I mean, I'm a David Letterman fan in a uh, like a uh, Conan fan. I don't I, I work so much I don't watch Conan anymore. Sorry, Conan. I know you're not listening, but but it's Dan and Jeff B. Davis. There's also the the documentary about it, I think is on Netflix, and this guy Spencer, which is like this. That's like the part about the uh, like how I don't know. I always look at people that can discover talent, like uh, they discovered Spencer. You know, when people have an eye for talent like that, that's if you watch this Harmontown documentary, it's great. But one of the best parts about it is watching this kid Spencer and realizing his wit. I, I don't know. You're just realizing, like, wow, they found. They, I don't know. I, again, I don't want to over talk it because. So listen to Harmontown. It's really funny, really genuine. You know, watch Rick and Morty. I think the next season is coming soon. Uh, so that's a little bit about Dan Harmon. Then we'll get into the story structure stuff. I totally screwed that up. Sorry, Dan. And then, to, to, you know, talk about, so then a chorus line is a musical. Uh, it was music by Marvin Hamlish, uh, lyrics by Edward Claiborne, and the book was by James Kirkwood Jr. and Nicholas Dante. It's uh, centered on 17 Broadway dancers auditioning for spots on a chorus line. It's set on the bare stage of a Broadway theater during the audition. A uh, chorus line provides a glimpse into the personality of the performers and the choreographer, you know, as they t- talk during their audition. Uh, following several workshops uh, in an off-Broadway production, it pre- premiered uh, the Schubert Theater Broadway and Broadway in 1975. Directed and choreographed by Michael Bennett. It was a hit, 12 Tony Awards, Pulitzer Prize for Drama. Uh, the original uh, production ran for 6,137 performances. Uh, longest running production until Cats took a beat it in 1997. And then Chicago passed that. It's still the sixth longest running Broadway performance. Uh, now, there's also the 2006 uh, revival of it, and that's uh, the performance I was on most of was by Natalie Cortez. It's it just a beautiful, nothing to take away from uh, the original by Priscilla Lopez. Uh, those are the two I listened to the most. But it was, uh, let's see, the 2006 revival uh, opened in uh, 2006 uh, and closed in 2008 after 759 performances. 
cost $8 million to finance and recouped its investment in 19 weeks. Uh, Mario Lopez was on the cast for a little while, and it was the subject of a documentary. I didn't know this, called Every Little Step. It was also a movie in 1985 that I never saw, starring Michael Douglas. Uh, I guess it says it was unsuccessful. It was it directed by Richard Attenborough. Is this right? Uh, but uh, so that's a little bit about the musical, the chorus line. But we're going to be talking about the song "Nothing," and the song "Nothing" is sung by the character uh, Diana Morales, and it is part of uh, montage number two, part two. Uh, so that's the song. So let's talk about now. So so there's it's a song uh, that will kind of uncover what it's about in the lyrics here. Uh, but so let's uh, like uh, let's see. So this uh, this is where I started with Dan's uh, story. His story embryo technique is what uh, I don't know if he calls it that. Uh, but this was all over at Dan's uh, Tumblr, danharmon.tumblr.com. I try to find the date over here. Um, this is supposed to three years ago, uh, but I don't see a date. But it, someone at Hey Ed, 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 Ed asked, uh, could you explain your story breaking process? It, this is a great place to start. And, and I actually, like, this is like uh, where I start doing some other stuff to get the ideas. And then I kind of use this uh, process that Dan talks about, which the episodes for uh, uh, what's the name of the series they do? Uh, Nuns in space. So I'm going to paraphrase. They dance to start with ideas, uh, and it, that can be anything. Uh, in this case, with Chorus Line, it's about uh, uh, acting school, I guess, is one of the ideas. Uh, but Dan says, you know, you can use poop, America, pickles, raccoon, number six, anything. Now, some ideas are going to come up with related ideas, uh, he says, you know, if you think about raccoons, you might say, well, let's think about other things about raccoons. And he says, clouds of related ideas that your mind recognizes as related in any way are potential story areas. Uh, look for areas that make you laugh and cry. And in the case of a chorus line, or a case of nothing, we'll, we'll see. I guess I'll read through this, then we'll kind of talk about how it applies. So then Dan says, draw a circle to symbolize your area because your story will take the reader through the, uh, and that's in quotes, you know, and reader means whoever is experiencing the story, uh, through related ideas in a path around a central idea. And he says, you know, you don't have to know what the central idea is. It might be dumb. You know, you're writing about raccoons. Now he says, divide your circle into a top half and a bottom half and ask yourself what those halves might be. And in the raccoon example, it might be positive thoughts about raccoons and negative thoughts about raccoons. And if that doesn't charge you, pick something else like raccoon thoughts and male raccoon thoughts and female raccoon thoughts or biological raccoon thoughts and storybook raccoon thoughts. And then at some point, you're going to divide the, the, that area into two parts that create a personal charge for you, like a battery. Like, oh, I like the idea that there's a difference between biological raccoons and storybook raccoons, you know, that tingled when I drew the line. I want to know more. And Dane says, that's impression of you nailing it. Uh, divide, the, d d divide the circle down the middle and pick another charge dichotomy for left and right. For instance, biological storybook raccoon could get divided into dishonest and honest. And now you have four quadrants. It's probably not easy to follow this, what's in spoken. So you just go to sleep. But, it, you know, uh, if you're, if you but you can also keep along for the ride and look in the show notes. Divide the circle down the middle and pick another charged economy for light and left and right, honest and dishonest. Now you have four quadrants going clockwise. You have biological, dishonest, raccoon. That would be the top right. Then storybook dishonest raccoon, then storybook honest raccoon, and then biological honest raccoon. Any point, this is the important part here, any point which you stop feeling charged, go back a step or start over. Now, maybe you got this far to realize you didn't want to write about raccoons. Uh, and he goes, people aren't going to like all this rewriting and restructuring. He says, stick with it. You know, that, that's how you tell stories. 
And he says, when you find an area that yields four charged quadrants, experiment with protagonists. You know, for, for him, he's like, okay, what about, how about a raccoon? So once upon a time, there was a dishonest biological raccoon that became a storybook raccoon. That led to him becoming honest before finally going back and becoming biological again. Cool, question mark? If it's not, go back and start over. Uh, again, uh, he says, no, people aren't going to want you to start over. He says, don't worry about that. Just keep it, keep it up until, it, until it char you feel charged, I think, is his point. And then we'll go into the structure stuff. So this is kind of the, the uh, I don't know what you'd call it, the, the mud or whatever. If we're going to make a mud pie, this is like mixing the water and the mud and the others, you know, a great little grass and everything. Okay, so let's go to the song Nothing. So the song Nothing is about Diana or Diana. I don't know which one because I don't, it's the only, actually the only song you listen to in the musical over and over again for the most part is this one. But uh, so if we start to look at the, the just what it's about, like the top and the bottom, like he said storybook, uh, like biological raccoon, storybook raccoon, you say, okay, what is this about it? And it's about she getting into this prestigious, uh, like the like the song is about her getting into this prestigious acting program, this uh, like high school uh, for the performing arts. So, boy, this is pressure's on. So, how do we break that into four quadrants? I mean, obviously, this is like Monday morning quarterbacking this part, but I think almost the top and the bottom would be. Like, at the top is like, geez, I'm going to go to high school to be an actress. And then the bottom is like, I can't be an actress or something. I don't know. I guess I'm losing it. Maybe we should just cut ahead to the structure. No, I don't think we should. Let, let me see. So I think, like, the contrast, what are the contrasts of the song that are charged for me? I guess because I'm choosing it and it's important is the contrast between it's about a song and her relationship with the teacher and her relationship with herself. So the song is about uh, she wants to be an actress and she feels like she, she got into this great high school for the performing arts because she wants to be an actress. And she, be, I mean, when you want to do something, at least part of you feels like you can become a great actress. And, of course, part of you feels like you can or is afraid that you can't or you won't. And I think that is the top and the bottom of the, this structure. If it's the top half of the circle and the bottom half, the top half is I can be an actress. And the bottom half is I cannot be an actress, which would be that's pretty charged, you know. Uh, and it brings the charge to the, the thing. And then the right half of the circle would be, you know, I need to be taught uh, to be like an actress. Like I need a good, I need a teacher, I need a mentor. Uh, to be an actress, and it's specific in the song to Mr. Carp. Uh, so I need Mr. Carp to teach me how to act, and, and on the other half uh, is I don't need Mr. Carp, or I don't need a, well, I think I don't need a little teacher, uh, it's not specific enough, but uh, I think that's the structure, uh, the basic uh this isn't the structure. I guess this is like the, the meat of the thing is like, I can be an actress. I can't be an actress. Uh, so if you were looking at the top right, if it was four quadrants, the first one would be Diana saying, I can be an actress if Mr. Carp teaches me how. And then the bottom right would be, I can't be an actress because Mr. Carp says I, I'm not good enough. And then the uh, bottom left would be, I can't be an actress, w w uh, hmm. and I don't need, I, w with, hmm, I don't know what the bottom left would be. This, this is why this is good. I guess it's a good thing we're not writing a Hollywood or a Broadway musical, but this is, you can see the power of the structure is when I'm saying, huh, the power of this technique is not in the answers it provides, but in the lens that it, it, it like allows you to place over your story to say, huh, and then Dan would say, go back and start over. Or find what's charged for you. So what in the second, the, the third, like a first quarter, second. So we're in the third quarter of the song. She, we're, so we're still in, I can't be an actress. I should give up, I guess, would be the bottom left thing. Like carp or no carp. So, and then the top one would be, I can be an actress. 
They just don't need Mr. Carp. Uh, there's a spoiler. So where where do we get lost? I guess we got lost with the Mr. Carp thing. The top and the bottom, I think, are solid because the top of the half is I can be an actress. And that's the beauty of the song in the, the, the beginning and the end is that the song starts with her joy of getting into this high school. And so I'm thinking and talking here, but it, and then that she's like, wow, I have, I got into the school. I must have a chance to be an actress. And then as we'll go through the structural points, it realizes that uh, she meets her teacher, Mr. Carp, who's going to enable her to be an actress. He's the representative of the school. And then we get down to the next tangent. It's like, oh, no, Mr. Carp says you can't, you're not going to be an actress. And then the next one would be, I can't be an actress. I guess like like this is would, would might be like, a, but we don't without Mr. Carp. I guess it's like Carp and no Carp. The, the left side of the structure is no Carp, and the right side is Carp. A teacher and no teacher. But I guess it's specific. I guess yeah. Now she's like, I can't be an actress and Mr. Carp. Uh, I don't know. I guess maybe I'm still stuck in that. And then the top half, though, is I don't need Mr. Carp to be a good actress. I can be a good actress. So, okay, so 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 far, not doing Dan justice, but you could see the, 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 that this is more about the lens and, like, being like, okay, luckily I'm not trying to write this. I'm just trying to... But you see where I'm getting lost. It's like, okay, and maybe it's because I'm not understanding the meat of the song. So let's go to another quadrant here. You know, this is a sleep podcast, so I can talk about whatever I want. Like, the name of the song is Nothing. So maybe this is where it's at. Is, uh, yeah, I guess this is, where the meat, it, this is where the subtext of the song is, and what does it for me is this lower subtext, uh, like, I guess this is some like somewhat like making a sandwich, uh, and this is like the good part of the sandwich. So I guess like another thing in the quadrants, I think it's still, I can be an actress and I can't be an actress. Uh, maybe like the, all four quadrants are, I feel nothing, but uh, the right side is, I feel nothing and that equals bad. And the left side is, I feel nothing that equals good. I guess that might be it, like, because... If the top right quadrant is, uh, I can be an actress uh, through Mr. Carp, but I feel nothing. She still tries to overcome it because she says, well, I can be an actress in the first quarter. With Mr. Carp, that'll help me overcome the fact that I feel nothing. And then we get into the bottom right half, and it says, no, 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 I can't be an actress because I feel nothing and because Mr. Carp tells me I can't be an actress. And then we get into the, like, uh, like the the, the 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 bottom left, where it's kind of like, huh? Well, I don't I don't need Mr. Carp or whatever. Mr. Carp's not going to help me, but I don't think I can become an actress because I feel nothing. But she's more accepting. She's like, I feel nothing. Maybe I can't be an actress. Maybe I should just give up. I can't be an actress. Yeah, there. That's it. So in the in the if you're you know you, this is why you write this stuff out. Like Dan says, get a paper and a pen. But so the bottom left quadrant, I guess, would be, I guess so I'm cheating. I'm using three things, but uh, the top and the bottom half is, so the bottom half is I can't be an actress, but it's an empowering. She's saying, geez, maybe I can't be an actress. I don't feel anything. And Mr. Carp says I can't be an actress. But that's when things turn, and that's where the beauty of the story and the power of this song takes place. Is that, it, like, acceptance allows her to find, whoa, wait a second, I feel nothing. Maybe that doesn't mean, maybe that, and that's where the story rises again. She says, oh, I feel nothing, but I don't need Mr. Carp. I can be an actress, and I feel nothing, and that's where it pays off. Oh, my goodness, it pays off. Okay, so I, if you're still with me, like, uh, that was, the, like, the basics of the story, Umbrio, the, just the breaking of the story. And you say, geez, you took a beautiful song, Scoots, and you broke it for me. And I'd say, well, I'd say, thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's what I do around, around here, these parts. But then let's talk about the specifics of structure. So D- Dan has, like, uh, I think four articles over at the Channel 101 Wiki. And they're great. I, I got to tell you, like, uh, I hear people that pay a ton of money to, to learn how to write stories. This will teach you 
Uh, let me just run through it. So this is by Dan. It's called Story Structure 101, super basic. And he, he, he again talks about make a circle and make it into four quadrants. And then start with the number one, where the number 12 would be in a clock. And then, like, uh, this one you probably need to see it. But you're basically going to end up with uh, eight points on the wheel, eight story points. Let me see if Dan explains it better. Storytelling is comes natural to humans. But since we live in an unnatural world, we sometimes need a little help. Uh, so he says, yeah, take a straw circle, divide it in half vertically, then horizontally. Uh, starting at the 12 o'clock position, going clockwise, uh, number the four points where the lines cross, one, three, five, and seven. Then number the quarter sections, two, four, six, and eight. So then it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here's Dan's structure. Uh, and it goes, I'll, I'll say the numbers and the structure, but it's pretty. Uh, number one, a character is in a zone of comfort. Uh, two, but they want something. Three, they enter an unfamiliar situation. Four, adapt to it. Five, get what they wanted. Six, pay a heavy price for it. Seven, return to the familiar situation. Eight, having changed. And Dan starts to talk about, you know, just start thinking about what stories you love and do they follow this structure. And a lot of this is based on, um, you know, the hero within and, and uh, like the monomyth and, and all this Joseph Campbell stuff and Aristotle talked about it and, and all that. And again, I can hear some people saying, oh, and I say, okay, well, you, like I don't write in structure or I, you know, that's too formulaic. It's like, exactly. But you need to learn, like uh, if you learn the basic structure, then it won't be for, I guess that's the weird irony or the paradox is if you really take the time to learn structure, whether it's Dan's structure or some other structure, pretty soon you'll learn that, okay, that's like, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I guess I don't know how to explain it. Like, uh, the, 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 but you need to learn story structure. Uh, you don't need to copy story structure. Use it like paint by numbers. Uh, I guess that's what I'm saying. So I get off my high horse and then go to Dan's story structure 102, pure boring theory. Uh, and Dan Tyne kind of said, this one's actually, you should just read this one because this is way deeper. And it talks about, you know, Jesus, like, uh, you know, the good news and the bad news or, you know, the shadow self. Well, let me read a little bit, you know, like life and, and you know, the state of not life uh, and how things are always in change. But it's usually change happens uh you know, like how we get fossil fuels. There was dinosaurs, and then they passed away, and then they got, you know, turned into goop, and now we drive around like using their stuff. Uh, you know, planet-wide creature life on Earth has been able to grow and thrive through an evolutionary arms race between uh, the various parts of itself. You know, the, some things, you know, we have a circle of life, as uh, that movie once sang. And this is what causes evolution and life to advance and spread. And that's what led to our brains. And he goes, geez, life in passing is 50%, you know, 50% of it. And then he says, well, maybe it's, con you know, and then he kind of uses it's conscious and unconscious. Yeah, this is a little easier for me. Like your mind's a home with upstairs and a downstairs. Upstairs, you know, things are well lit and swept and, People come over and you serve hot cocoa and play Scrabble. Downstairs is where you got all the uh, creaky stuff. And for me, it's the story swamp. It's the unconscious and it's the stuff you don't, won't, or can't think about. You know, whether you use Freud or Jungian, you know, there could be, you know, wires and pipes and stuff. And you could say, oh, there's a pipe, there's a cigar down there. I don't smoke cigars. And you say, really? But this is also like where the life-sustaining energy is, but it's primitive and it's stinky and, you know, a lot of times we'd rather not think about it. But Dan says, however, your pleasure, your sanity, and, and your you know prosperity kind of depend on occasional round trips and you've got to change the fuses, you know, get some Christmas ornaments, clean out the litter box. So you can't keep the basement sealed, otherwise the whole home will become unstable. 
and then the things will get loud, and then you'll try to cover up with neurotic behavior. Uh, this sounds just like me. And for some, you know, the basement door could come off the hinges, uh, and then, you know, then who knows? The whole point is, according to Dan, occasional ventures by the ego into the unconscious, though through therapy, meditation, uh, confession, and, you know, other activity, you know, cathartic activities are a good story. Keep the consciousness in working order. This is the rhythm of psychology. Conscious, unconscious, conscious, unconscious. And then Dan kind of talks about a similar idea with order and chaos, uh, like as society's rhythm, uh, like with order and then chaos and then order and then chaos. That's the rhythm of society. And he talks about resonance. Now you understand that all life, including the human mind and the communities we create, create, march to the same very specific beat. If your story also marches to this beat, uh, it will resonate. It will also send your audience's ego on a brief trip to the unconscious and back. Your audience has an instinctive taste for that, and they're going to say yum. So then I'm going to just read through the last two here. Story Structure 103, let's simplify, Dan says. And here's the steps again, boiled down to their barest minimum while still being in English. Step one, when you. Step two, have a need. Step three, you go somewhere. Step four, search for it. Uh, step five, find it. Step six, take it. Step seven, then return. And then step eight, change things. Or even more basic, you need, you, step one, you, step two, need, step three, go, step four, search, step five, find, step six, take, step seven, return, and step eight, change. So let's see if we can just apply that to the song, like, uh, while we, with our last, uh, cause I tend to, I guess I rambled a little bit. When you have a need, you go somewhere, search for it, find it, take it, then return and change things. So what I'm going to do is read through the lyrics of the song. But just think about that the song is based on the conscious and unconscious or the chaos and the disorder, the life and death thing of, uh, you know, I can be an actress versus I cannot be an actress. And then also balanced out by this idea of like... uh I can I, I don't feel anything that's a bad thing versus I don't feel anything that's just who I am or that's not a bad thing, that, that that's like an acceptance versus a denial. Okay, so this is nothing by the character of Diana. I'm excited because I'm going to go to the high school of the performing arts. I mean, it was, and this song is so beautiful. I mean, literally, it, it, it gives me the chills every time I hear it, especially when Natalie Cortez sings it. Uh, but it, I was excited because I was going to go to the High School of Performing Arts. I mean, I was dying to be a serious actress. Anyway, it's the first, first day of acting class. And we're in the auditorium, and the teacher, Mr. Carp, oh, Mr. Carp, anyway, he puts us upstage with our legs around one another one in the back of each other, and he says, okay, we're going to do improvisations. Now you're on a bobsled, and it's snowing out, and it's cold. Okay, go. And this is when the song itself really gets good, but every day for a week we would try to feel the motion, uh, feel the motion down the hill. Every week for a, Every day for a week we would try to hear the wind rush. Hear the wind rush, feel the chill. And here's where my chills come in. And I dug right down to the bottom of the soul, my soul, to see what I had inside. Yes, I dug right down to the bottom of the soul, my soul, and I tried. I tried. And then she does an aside. She says, and everybody's going, whoosh, whoosh. I feel the snow. I feel the cold. I feel the air. And Mr. Carp turns to me and he says, Okay, Morales, what did you feel? I'm getting the chills. I'm not kidding as I speak. And I said, nothing. I'm feeling nothing. And he says, nothing could get a girl transferred. They all felt something, but I felt nothing, except the feeling that this bullshit was absurd. But I said to myself, hey, it's just the first week. Maybe it's genetic. They don't have bobsleds in San Juan. 
second week more advanced and we had to be a table, uh, be a sports car, ice cream cone. Mr. Carp, he would say, very good, except Morales. Try Morales all alone. And I dug right down to the bottom of my soul to see how an ice cream felt. Yes, I dug right down to the bottom of my soul and I tried to melt. The kids yelled nothing. They called me nothing. And Mr. Carp allowed it, which really makes me burn. They were so helpful. They called me hopeless. You know what part of song this is, right? Holy. Until I didn't, really didn't know where else to turn. And Mr. Carp kept saying, Morales, I think you should transfer to Girls High. You'll never be an actress. Never. Uh, and Morales says, Jesus Christ went to church praying, Santa Maria, send me guidance. Send me guidance on my knees. Went to church praying, Santa Maria, help me feel it, help me feel it, pretty please. And a voice from down at the bottom of my soul came up to the top of my head. And a voice from down at the bottom of my soul, and here is what it said. This man is nothing. This course is nothing. If you want something, go find another class. And when you find one, you'll be an actress. And I assure you, that's finally what came to pass. Six years later, I heard that Carp had died, and I dug right down to the bottom of my soul, and I cried because I felt nothing. And you can immediately, if you've been listening, you can see, I mean, holy moly, uh, how... I mean, many payoffs this song has in, in a structural story way and how much it just gives us a whole, I mean, and, and I, yes, I'm being a fanboy about dance structure and about this song, but I mean, holy moly. Uh, so let me just run through what the song is about uh, just in case. I mean, basically, Morales, she goes to the high school of performing arts She's got this teacher, probably a top teacher, Mr. Carp. And he says, here's how you act. You pretend you're on a bobsled. That's how you become a great actress. And it's, in, in, in this story, he's, that's the only way to become a great actress. And so they do this bobsled pretend thing, and she feels, and she says, she says this doesn't work for me. And he says, no, 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 it's not that it doesn't work for you. It's that you're not an actress. Try again. And because she was like, I don't feel anything. This is just strange. But she said, okay, let me try again. And then the second week, it would be a table, be a sports car, ice cream cone. And he said, you know, everybody's doing great except for you, Morales. You know, can, can you try one more time up on stage by yourself? And she dug right down to the bottom of her soul to see how an ice cream felt. And she tried, and, and not only could she feel nothing, but then the, she, was, she was subject to humiliation by the class, saying, you're nothing, and Carp allowed it. Uh, they called me hopeless until I really didn't know where else to turn. And Carp said, you know, if you, you're never going to be an actress, Morales. And then she was at a point where she fell to her knees, and she said, uh, Santa Maria, send me guidance, pretty please. And she dug right down to the bottom of her soul. And here's what it said. This man is nothing. This course is nothing. It's not you. It's this full carp. If you want something, if you want to be an actress, go find a better class. And then the empowerment part. And I assure you that is what finally came to pass. And then the beauty of the, the, the final structure point, which we'll get into, is that it has the last payoff. You say, well, geez, she, okay, she became an actress. No, 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 there's more. Six months later, I heard that carpet died, and I dug right down to the bottom of my soul, and I cried because I felt nothing. 
Uh, so let's just pause there because that's like the the end part. I mean, we're at the end of the eight and change. When you, ha- when you have a need, you go somewhere, search for it, find it, take it, then return and change things. And in step uh, one or step 104, Dan kind of talks about the more specifics, but you is a character in a zone of comfort. So you, in this case, is Morales, uh, Diana, and she is she just she's in a zone of comfort. She just got into the high school of the performing arts uh, need. Uh, they want something. She wants to be an actress. And she wants to do well in Mr. Carp's class because he's the, he's her acting teacher. Uh, go, they enter an unfamiliar situation. In her case, it's this method acting with the stupid uh, bobsled thing where you sit there and you pretend you're on a bobsled. So you need go. Diana wants to be an actress, goes to girls' high to acting class, starts Carp's class, uh, step one, pretend you're bobsled. She feels nothing. And this is, you know, where you get into the middle part of the show. This is like the act two. So then search, you need go uh, search, which is like, a, I guess, step two. Or I guess step one and step two of the second week. We uh, tried to be an ice cream, you know, sports car, uh, be a table, ice cream cone. And she dug right down to the bottom of her soul to see how ice cream felt. And she felt nothing. And then it goes so fine. Uh, she finds that t- two tries, she still feels nothing. Not only does she feel nothing, but that's a bad thing, according to Mr. Carp and according to Mr. Carp letting the class bully her and say, uh, you're hopeless. They were so ho- helpful. They called me hopeless. And Mr. Carp allowed it. So, so even then, we get a little bit of uh, the find, find what they wanted. Step five, and step five is at the bottom of the circle, uh, which in this case is I can't be an actress. And she finds she feels nothing. Mr. Carp allowed the class to make fun of her. He said, repeated that she'll never be an actress. She should transfer to girls' high. And she, she's almost lost all hope. She's gone, and this is deep in the subconscious or wherever your belief system is, in the deep in the underworld, she falls to her knees. And it's even witty how she says Jesus Christ out of anger and then goes straight into this prayer to Santa Maria. It just shows the quality of the right song, the lyric writing. But, you, you know, find and then take. You have to be, you, uh, you have to pay the price to acquire what you want uh, and take, which is step six, which is the first step. So she's down on her knees, and then she makes a call out to Santa Maria or the universe. And it's also this repeat of this, you know, the chorus where she says, and I dug right down to the bottom of my soul. And she tried with the first two ones. And then she says, you know, St. Mary, please help me feel pretty, please. And then this time, instead of digging, the voice comes up from the bottom of my soul, came up to the top of my head. And the voice from down at the bottom of my soul hears what it said. Uh, and it says, this man is nothing. And now this is where I get, I guess, mixed up in the story structure. Is it like... I mean, she's paying the price at this point. She's given up, uh, like she's fallen to her knees and said she's without external help uh, from either the depths of my soul or from Santa Maria up in heaven or whatever. I have no hope, you know, the earthly conscious power of Mr. Carp and my classmates and this is the best acting school of performing arts have said you will never be an actress. But as this soul or this gut thing, she says, geez, that's where I, but I crave to be an actress so badly. And then the answer comes back to her. Like, so this is take and find, I think, was that the next one? Take, oh, and return, you know, so she, she, she almost has to give up hope and also say, the answer comes back and not, it's a hard one. It, it sounds easy because it's in a witty song, but actually this is where most people, the answer comes back. It says, uh, 
hey, this man is nothing, this class is nothing. If you really want to be an actress, you got to work your ass off. And screw Mr. Carp. And screw these punk who do high school or performing arts punks. Go find a better class. Don't give up. And she's actually living her story structure because saying, "Hey, you, you got to get you, you got to start climbing up this freaking half circle here." Dan Harmon's half story embryo. Get off your ass and return. You know, return to to you know. You got to get out of this. I can't be an actress and climb just up a past that threshold to I can be an actress. I just have to find a better class. So return to the world and go in search of what is going to let you become a great actress. But as I said, the brilliance of story doesn't just stop there. It says, okay, so Diana Morales is out there now uh, looking for a better class. You say, well, no, no, what about that other part of the story where she feels nothing? Wasn't that a central part of what was the resonance of why I, that's why I connect with the song? So if that's not uh, resolved somehow... It also doesn't make any sense. It's like, okay, so she went to find another class, but she can't she? She just doesn't feel nothing. So how is she going to be a great actress? And I think this is where this is why this song was. I mean, I'm sure this is reflected in the rest of a chorus line. This little difference is maybe where greatness comes through. And if this is like a way to put a lens on it with Dan's structure here, say. Okay, so she went back and she looked for a new class. No, 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 no. And then how's the read again? It says, uh, yeah, six months later, and well, first she says, finally, it did come to pass. I did go out. I did return, and I did search and find another class. But then she says, six months later, I heard that Carp had died. I can't believe how good this is. As someone that writes stuff, I just can't believe how good this is. Six months later, I heard that Carp had died. And I dug right down to the bottom of my soul, and I cried. But, okay, oh, you say, oh, okay, that makes sense. So she's finally feeling something. I say, no, 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 no. You know, that, that, that's, not, that's not where truth lies and change lies. And the real resonance is we know uh, we're broken people, uh, and we identify with other broken people that are struggling in, in rising. If it's a character in a story, I say, well... I mean, this is what you hear a lot of people complain about, you know, about pop, pop culture stuff. We're not in, we're doing that, but I, I, I'm, I'm having the chills again. Six months later, I heard the carpet died, and I dug right down to the bottom of my soul, and I cried. But why'd you cry, Diana? Because I felt nothing. And even leaves it open a little bit. It's like, okay, she's achieved success. The circular journey we went on in the song has paid off, and our character's rising back up again into the uh, world of I can be an actress. And in some sense, she's been healed because she says, well, I don't need Mr. Carp. But then it goes beyond that. It goes to the change thing that Dan was talking about and the monomyth and uh, why we get, why do I get the chills? Because she's come to somewhat of an acceptance that she feels. Now, she hasn't changed. She's going to say, well, now I chew gum and I'm just so darn happy. And maybe this is me projecting, but to me, it's, she says, uh, and I felt nothing. Like I cried at Carp's funeral because I didn't, because I didn't care. I mean, that's definitely projection, but like that, uh, I've achieved what I wanted but I'm still a human being, and I'm still, I, I've achieved both an acceptance, but not a comfortableness. You know, there's a difference between being comfortable with something and accepting it. And those are so, same things that are just so human and, and relatable. Oh, boy, it is so good. I mean, I, I, I know I'm gushing here about this, but it's like, uh, I get a, I, I'm just going to close. I'm going to read the lyrics one more time and just think about the structure. I'll read the dance structure. And then the lyrics, and then good night, okay? So just think about this. When you have a need, you go somewhere, you search for it, you find it, you take it, then return and change things. You need to go search, find, take, return, change. And these are the lyrics from Nothing from a chorus line. 
I'm so excited because I'm going to go to the high school of the performing arts. I mean, I was dying to be a serious actress. Anyway, it's the first day of acting class, and we're in the auditorium, and the teacher, Mr. Carp, oh, Mr. Carp, anyway, he puts us up on stage with our legs around one another, one in back of another, and he says, okay, we're going to do improvisations. Now you're on a bobsled, it's snowing out, and it's cold. Okay, go. Every day for a week we would try to feel the motion, feel the motion down the hill. Every day for a week we would try to hear the wind rush, hear the wind rush, feel the chill. And I dug right down to the bottom of my soul to see what I had inside. Yes, I dug right down to the bottom of my soul, and I tried. I tried. And everybody's going, whoosh, whoosh. I feel the snow. I feel the cold. I feel the air. And Mr. Carp turns to me, and he says, okay, Morales, what do you feel? And I said, nothing. I'm feeling nothing. And he says, nothing could get a girl transferred. They all felt something. But I felt nothing, except this feeling that this bullshit was absurd. But I said to myself, hey, it's only the first week. Maybe it's genetic. They don't have bobsleds in San Juan. Second week more advanced, we had to be a table, be a sports car, ice cream cone. Mr. Carpy would say, very good, except Morales. Try Morales all alone. And I dug right down to the bottom of my soul to see how an ice cream felt. Yes, I dug right down to the bottom of my soul and I tried to melt. The kids yelled nothing. They called me nothing. And Carp allowed it, which really makes me burn. They were so helpful. They called me hopeless. Until I really didn't know where else to turn. And Carp kept saying, Morales, I think you should transfer to girls high. You'll never be an actress, never. Jesus Christ went to church praying, Santa Maria, send me guidance. Send me guidance on my knees. Went to church praying, Santa Maria, help me feel it. Help me feel it pretty, please. And a voice from down at the bottom of my soul came up to the top of my head. And a voice from down at the bottom of my soul here is what it said. This man is nothing. This course is nothing. If you want something, go find another class. And when you find one, you'll be an actress. And I assure you, that's finally what came to pass. Six months later, I heard the carpet died. And I dug right down to the bottom of my soul. And I cried. Because I felt nothing. All right, everybody, good night. Uh, I want to say good night to some people on Twitter. Alexandra S. Uh, J.S. Nodgers. Jonathan M. Roberta W. Uh, 10F10. Kim H. Uh, thanks and good night. Uh, T.Jazz89. Uh, Jeff S., thanks and good night. Babs, be like Babs. Thanks, Lisa S. to the P., thanks and good night. Emily Z., thanks and good night. Uh, K. E. Anka, K. K. Anka, thanks and good night. Uh, uh, Becky H., thanks and good night. Ryan, thanks and good night. Mary Beth, thank you and good night. Uh, Nate O., thank you and good night. Uh, Haley S., thank you and good night. Uh, Claire O., thank you and good night. Lydia P., thank you and good night. Host to Hostress, and thanks and good night. Adrian F., thanks and good night. Uh, Dusty, thanks and good night. Uh, Acoustic Sheep, thanks and good night. Jessica P., thanks and good night. Nug, thanks and good night. Megan C., thank you and good night. Greg H., Des, thanks and good night. Kim L, thank you and good night. Katie C, thank you so much and good night. Uh, Chevy, thanks and good night. Uh, 
Bassy, thank you and good night. Bassy World, Sarah R, thank you so much and good night. Uh, Nolly N M, thank you and good night. Uh, sleep well. Cassie Semi Bold, thank you and good night. Dystopian, thank you and good night. Jelly Sock, thanks and good night. Uh, Adam Big Red, thanks and good night. Mark D, thanks and good night. Justin C, thank you and good night. Penny La Lane, thanks and good night. Chrysanthi, thanks and good night. Uh, Prim Reaper, thanks and good night. Lynette, thanks and good night. Uh, Blue Shirt, thanks and good night. Richard P, cracking me up, thanks and good night. Kevin M, thanks and good night. Uh, Soap, uh, thanks and good night. Uh, uh, Simply Soap. Uh, So Heart, thank you and good night. Uh, Tonya, thank you and good night. History Prof. Uh, Carrie, Echo Textual, thank you and good night. M. Conrad, thanks and good night. Sean W. Riz, thanks and good night. Uh, Jason S., thanks and good night. Uh, Jillian, thanks and good night. Jessica M., thanks and good night. Audrey B., thanks and good night. Daniel O., thanks and good night. Mandana, thanks and good night. Uh, Stephanie L., thank you and good night. Jennifer C., thanks and good night. Suzanne W., thanks and good night. Julia S., is so subtle that seasoning, thanks and good night. Uh, Ricardo G., thank you and good night. Tonya M., thanks and good night. Julia C., thank you and good night. Uh, Michelle, thanks and good night. Frey D., thanks and good night. Shelby, thanks and good night. Uh, Maggie G., thanks and good night. Lori S., thanks and good night. Jane L., thanks and good night. Vivian G., thanks and good night. Maywood, thanks and good night. John M., thanks and good night. Jessica K., thank you and good night. Uh, the Sophie, thanks and good night. Urban, urban, urban normal, urban animal, thanks and good night. Shauna, thanks and good night. Perla, thank you and good night. Pogu, thank you and good night. Little Pink Ninja, thanks and good night. Uh, Lauren M., thanks and good night. Celebrity Oxford Kama, thank you and good night. Jan- Janine A., thank you and good night. Lauren S., thanks and good night. Matt, thank you and good night. Uh, Janine, thanks and good night. Miss Black, thanks and good night. Christiana, thanks and good night. And Samantha B., thanks and good night. Thanks and good night, everybody.